Okay, hello, and um, I'll introduce myself a bit. Um, I should uh, make uh, the acknowledgement that I'm here as an imposter. I'm not a geospatial analyst, uh, I'm not an osteologist, I'm an excavator and photographer. And uh, in many ways, I, I'm the monkey in the machine who's producing data for the people. And it's, it's much a more microscopic view of things than uh, the previous paper. And move on. Uh, I will be showing images of actual human remains later on, so if anyone's got a problem with that, then please leave. Um, I've also noticed some people who I'm probably going to be referencing quite badly, so I apologise for that as well. Okay, I also want a bit of audience participation, because I'm not used to speaking, and this is quite scary. So if you all join in, hands up, who's got a skeleton? Hey, most of you, great. Um, <laughs> It will also uh, serve to try and uh, narrow down the particular topic that I'm talking about. Um, who's got skeleton in 3D? Who's got 3D data skeletons? Okay, not so many of you. Uh, who's got 3D data of skeletons in situ? Okay, yeah. Uh, how many of you actually use that data when you're doing your final research and interpretation? Uh, more than I thought, but still, not, not, uh, still fewer of you than have the data. And then, uh, just out of my own interest, how many of you take routinely take multiple uh, models of individual uh, individual skeletons? Okay, one of you, right? And me. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, I will go through a, a bit of a summary about 3D recording in archaeology. I'll just have to find my place. Ooh, microphone. Okay. Um, adoption of 3D recording in archaeology is well attested. Uh, there have been a variety of approaches to 3D documentation and excavations, ranging from end-of-day snapshots, which we saw a bit of today in one of the other sessions, uh, systematic single contact modelling, or modelling of only modelling things of importance. Uh, one of the most common uses is for um, uh, inhumations, but it's still not uh, by any means standard practice, and the way it's applied isn't standardised either. Um, among the well-known um, advantages uh, are uh, data capture times. That's a huge advantage. Um, also, uh, resolution compared to traditional um, modelling, that's not a very good example of it. Uh, but also being able to recall things which are ordinarily quite difficult to plan. Um, oh, I'll go back. Um, the um, uh, uh, last year's CAA and uh, a few other conferences, uh, there have been some of the UK companies uh, demonstrating that um, uh, this kind of recording isn't only um, useful in these three main ways, but it's also cost effective even when they take into uh, long term archiving with uh, trusted repositories. Uh, so there's, there's a definite um, strong reasons for uptake. Um, uh, on, um, uh, if we go beyond the, the, the field capture itself, there have been some very good uh, examples of taking this data and starting to integrate them into. Uh, uh, more complex interfaces and join the data up, specifically Alkin Eng uh, very recently uh, with their online web viewer, which is, um, takes a slightly different view and um, approach to, to somewhere they start segmenting out the 3D uh, models um, that they've generated, whereas a lot of other approaches will uh, adopt um, approaches more familiar to 2D, 2D place based planning with tracing and uh, using vector lines and these kind of things. Um, uh, however, uh, a lot of the time, this type of integration is uh, far from uh, um, it, it is a non-trivial task, and uh, it's uh, out of reach of, an, of a lot of projects to really get that ad, um, advantage. Um, and this is where uh, it's a little bit more contentious. Is arguably a lot of the really good advantages: the um, the data capture, the cost efficiency, the um, uh, interlinked data don't necessarily require 3D. Uh, in, in some ways, especially where uh, certain workflows uh, are following these 2D plan uh, tracing uh, and uh, integration in more, more planar models, the 3D data is, is almost um, uh, accidental, well, not incidental, I should say. Um, <clears throat> now, um, Part of the, 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 the result of that is, although archaeology is fundamentally a, a 3D experience, a 3D um, a discipline which has always worked uh, in 3D, uh, when it comes down to actually um, interacting and thinking in 3D, this is uh, less um, 
Oh, well, I've lost my train of thought. I'll start again. Yeah. Um, the when we start the types of three D um, thinking which is allowed by the three D data, which we're now more routinely collect collecting, I would say, is um, so subtly different to the types of uh, 3D thinking which is uh, familiar within the archaeological practice. There are sometimes tensions between people in the more uh, technocentric areas of uh, uh, archaeology and more traditional based practices, uh, practitioners. The archaeologists don't think in 3D. This isn't true, but there are certainly subtle differences uh, which can be gained through um, these interactions with uh, these different types of data. Um, however, um, meaningful interaction with uh, 3D material from a lot of the, the published records so far seems somehow elusive. Um, so why are we uh, recording skeletons in 3D if uh, a lot of the time we're not necessarily uh, interacting with them directly in 3D uh, when it comes to our post-process um, analysis? Um, and uh, what should we look, be, be looking to to um, direct our um, uh, on-site choices for, for data collection strategies and um, processes? Uh, go back. <laughs> um, um, <clears throat> Yeah, in in some parts, the the um, the, uh, the origin of this talk has perhaps come from a crisis of faith. So having spent years and years taking the photos, and making these models, and seeing the widespread adoption around me, um, uh, at the same time, uh, it's harder to know, uh, find anyone who can really uh, point out and say exactly why it is that they're doing it. However, there are lots of uh, other developments in 3D um, technology which are, are, are being applied both to human remains um, off-site, uh, um, which, um, oh, oh. Oh, I'll skip on. Yay! <laughs> um, I'm not going to talk about that, obviously. Uh, there's lots of wonderful things with um, uh, um, outreach and, and these kind of things, but I'm more interested in the types of processes and um, interpretation processes we go through as archaeologists on site. So there's uh, a lot of um, adoption of 3D uh, recording in crime teams investigation, as well as in archaeology and medical sciences, people using it to characterise um, uh, injuries, um, looking at uh, fracture patterns, uh, very detailed uh, analysis of cut marks and things like that. However, a lot of these are done ex situ rather than in situ, even though quite often the same methodology and capture techniques used uh, off site are those which are applied on site. However, we give ourselves different baselines when recording in the field rather than out of the field. There are many practical reasons for this, uh, however, um, uh, the grim reality of archaeology is more often than not. Um, either preservation or um, uh, financial constraints mean that uh, full osteological investigations are not uh, a, a reality. Uh, and we have a, a, a growing um, corpus of 3D data from excavation, um, but little direction in terms of what the appropriate data quality should be uh, in the future. Um, uh, one of last year's uh, talks I thought was quite nice, which uh, um, illustrates some of the nuanced ways in which we can think differently in 3D as um, familiarity with 3D data becomes more widespread within the field. I was looking at the uh, taponomic processes recorded at, at, the, at the body farm, where um, uh, and I don't know if anyone's uh, seen that video, but it's well, well worth having a look and it's um, when, talk, when talking through um, uh, when working on site and talking with all the other archaeologists who less frequently interact with this data and becomes apparent where the um, 
the lack of conversation is between different sections of our, our, of our uh, community. Um, um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of advances in um, other types of data analysis. Again, uh, largely with uh, offsite material, um, uh, both in animal, human, ana uh, animal remains, uh, bringing in um, um, morphometrics, looking at large uh, studies of large populations, uh, uh, large uh, collections of data, uh, but also in the medical sciences, um, where collections of three D data is being used for modelling, as in. Um, uh, predictive modelling or uh, to improve um, uh, orthopaedic prosthetics uh, where uh, the idea being that they can take relatively small or partial uh, samples of data and extrapolate um, uh, and extrapolate uh, um, um, reliable uh, models of, of how um, oh, I'll skip that again. Um, so, um, under, underlying all this is uh, uh, following on a bit from what Gary was saying that we need to question ourselves in terms of why we're applying this technology. Is uh, there's a there's a mismatch between what our technology can do and could be doing for us at the moment, and what we're doing with it. Not necessarily because we don't know how to use the technology, but we're not entirely sure what the questions we want to ask of our data are. So we're seeing um, data which is routinely collected or um, modified to match our, uh, the technical abilities of the systems we, we, that we're using. And they are then driving the questions which we ask of our data, which then uh, applies the uh, methodology which we carry out on site. Uh, and in the uh, in the fervor for uh, efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness, we've been in danger of forgetting the, the questions that we would like to ask of our uh, excavation data. Um, had we um, started uh, from from the point of excavation, okay, I'll stop there. <laughs>